Hi everyone, this is Sharan here. Welcome to my channel. Today in this video, we are going to see about sequential pattern mining. In the previous session, we learned about market basket analysis. So in market basket analysis, what we learned was we learned how to identify various items bought by the customer together. So if a customer buys a product A, we know what is the next, what is the most likely other product the customer might buy. So this is based on the a priori algorithm, very similar to the recommendation engines as well. So in today's video, what we are going to do is we are going to learn something very similar, but here we are going to introduce the sequence into it. So in the previous example, there wasn't any sequence, like customer buys product A, most likely he's going to buy product B, but there is no sequence between product A and B. So it's not like after buying product A, he goes to product B. So it, it's kind of like both of them happen together most likely. But in today's uh, video, the concept is like a sequential pattern mining, which means that there is a sequence between the items that happen together. So when an uh, uh, user maybe buys an uh, item A today, what is the most likely product that the user might buy maybe in the next few days? So that's about the sequential pattern mining. So let's see about what is sequential pattern mining. Let's first understand what is the definition of a sequential pattern mining. So as you see on my screen here, so sequential pattern mining is used when we have a data set that has a sequence in it. We look for specific, like what we do here is we look for a specific subsequence that happens within the data set. So we identify all of these subsequences that are popular enough or those that crosses the threshold, like support threshold set by us. And we identify these as like predominant patterns that are present in the data set. So in order to explain you maybe with an example, so if you uh, uh, see here, so this is a simple example, let's say uh, that there is a major flood event that happens in a particular location. So what happens is like immediately when the flood is happening, there is a huge risk to life property drops like various, various public properties. There is a huge risk for all of this. So the immediate focus should be to save uh, safeguard and protect the people, animals and the public property. After the flood, then what happens is mostly like uh, people will start to report like uh, damages to their property. Also, there will be a huge damages to the public property. We would slowly get to know about what are all the various damages. So after, after here, like what happens is there will be a lot of waste generation at a household level. There will be various electronics items that might not be usable. So it will be like a, uh, there will be a, a huge amount of waste getting generated at the same time. So after that, what happens is like generally like people know about the extent of damage and there will be a lot of insurance claims. Then what happens is then the demand for the household item again starts to increase. So this is kind of a sequence which might happen like most likely. Similarly here, like, uh, like once we know, get to know about the damages to the public property, so then like there might be some power outages, like maybe that might be some disruptions. There might be internet outages too because of the damages that was caused due to the flood. And then there will be a demand for a lot of technicians to address these issues. So here, if you see, like once, like after a major event, there is a sequence of things that happens. So not only for uh, like major event, like if you can take like any example, like what happens in, like in, in a month, like what are all the various expenses, what do you do? When you get into a website, how you browse through the various pages, what is the home page? from home page to which other pages you do, what is the path that you take? So any data set that has, that can have sequential details into it, so then like sequential pattern analysis can be used. We can exactly identify what are all the various sequential patterns that are popular in the data set. What is the most common route that the customer takes from the home page to buy in a particular product? So we know exactly like, how the customers are going through. So, um, so this is a uh, very important technique that can be really used in uh, various scenarios to exactly understand about the maybe the customer behavior or to understand about the flow of various events. So let's maybe see in detail. Let's see like how implementing this particular algorithm will look like. So as you see on my screen here, on the left hand side most, there is a raw data. So how you need to read this data is the first column that you see here. So this is the sequence ID. So this can be compared with, let's say a customer ID. So customer one, uh, 
the second column is the event ID. So event ID is kind of a timestamp when a particular event happens. So let's state one as a particular customer. So then let's state 10 as the date in a particular month. So the customer one on 10th, the third column is the number of items. So here it means that two items, the various items are three and four. So the customer one on 10th of a month buys two items, the items are three and four. So three and four happens together on this particular day on a particular time. Then what happens is the customer once again goes to back to the same shop. On the 15th, he buys three items. So he buys item one, two and three. So this is, this is how you need to read it. So the a priori sequence algorithm, like uh, uh, this can be implemented both using R, Python or like maybe other programming languages too. There are various packages and libraries that supports the implementation of this particular algorithm. In R, the advantage is like when you use an a priori sequence algorithm, it allows you to use the text data. For example, here we have two items, three and four. So three and four like are represented as integers here. So actually three might represent something like a bread and four might represent something like butter. But what we need to do in Python uh, in order to use this particular package, we need to integer encode all the items. So first we need to identify what are all the various items that are possible to occur. And then for each of those items, we need to integer encode it. We need to replace that item with an unit integer. And then we need to generate this kind of a data set. Whereas in case of R, like if we allow the data set to be verbose, so then what happens is we can just use those data as it is, like it will be easy for us to read. So then what happens is like, what are all the very first, what happens is this algorithm first identify the various patterns. So if you see here, so we have item one. So item one is from uh, this particular column, the various items that occur in the data set. So when we say item one, what we are able to see is we are able to see item one in all the four sequence ID. Like these are all the sequence ID. We can say it as all the four customers, like if we have a customer data set. So one, two, three, and four, all the sequence ID. Item one is present here in one. It is present in two. It is present in three. It is present in four as well. So it is present in all the four, uh, four sequences that, have, that we have in this particular data set. Similarly, two is also present in all the um, uh, all the four sequence IDs that we have here. So if I take uh, four here, so we can see four definitely in one. We don't have any four in sequence ID two. We do not have any four in sequence ID three, and we do have an four in the sequence ID four. So if we see here for item four, it occurs in two sequence IDs, like maybe two for two specific customers. So there are maybe two customers who buys the item four. And similarly, six happens in all the sequence IDs. So when we go on to like a uh, two element, like f customers who buy four and then move on to buy six. So four to six. So if we see here, so for sequence ID one, we do have four. And in the event ID 15, we do not have any six. Whereas in the event uh, event ID 20, we do have in SIDS. So four occurs and then after a particular time, SIDS happens. So four to SIDS. So it definitely happens in one. So if I go to two, I do not have any uh, four in it. So uh, there is no uh, four SIDS pattern. So if I move on to three, there is definitely no four to SIDS pattern. So if I go to the sequence ID 4 here, the last three uh, rows here, there is an 4, item 4 uttering here, and then 6 do, does it happen like immediately after it. The event IDs are 10 and 20. So what we see here is 4 to 6 utters twice, like of the 4 uh, sequence IDs that we have. So what it does is it, it identifies various patterns, like what are all the various patterns depending upon what threshold we set. So next, what happens is we try to understand the metrics of what the, this particular data set, like what is the support, confidence, lift. Because after identifying the various patterns, it is based on these metrics, we would be able to exactly filter the interesting insights. If the support is quite low, it just means that it is a rare event. It doesn't make much sense for us to like, look into it. If the support is quite large, it means that it is quite popular. It utters a lot of... Uh, scenarios so we need to definitely look into it so here what we have is we have uh, we have this sequence so 
So here, this is the sequence within the bracket. So for sequence, which is just uh, one, uh, like one uttering as in standalone item. So it occurs in all the four sequence IDs. So we have only four sequence IDs. So support is one. So we have uh, uh, four by four and it, it, is, it is one. In case of, uh, in case of uh, four to six, so let's take this particular example. So we just saw that four to six, it happens in two of those sequences. So it happens in one and it happens in sequence four. So in this particular scenario, there are totally in total, there are four sequence IDs, one, two, three, four, and four to six happens in two of those sequence IDs. So two divided by four is 50%. So what we see here is the support is 50%. So this is how we calculate mathematically, we identify various sequential patterns in a sequential data set. So as you can see here, any data set, any data set, if you can transform that particular data set into this data set here. So if we can have a sequence ID, which can be same as a customer ID. If we can have an event ID, which is the timestamp, like it can be a day of a month or a time of a particular day. And what we, if we have the various items that happens at that particular point in time, so then that is good enough for us to go ahead and implement the sequential pattern analysis and identify various sequential data. Moving on to the next one, what are all the applications of sequential uh, pattern analysis? So sequential pattern analysis can be very useful in order to understand about the expense patterns of a particular user or maybe expense patterns of a certain group of users. So what happens first? Like once the salary is predicted, what are all the various expenses that usually happen? So when is the, like when a particular event happens, what is the most likely next event to happen? Similarly, shopping sequence. So when you get into, like, get into a shop or when you are browsing your, like maybe Amazon uh, online store, what, are, what is the sequence with which you go? When you buy an item A today, what are all the most likely items that you are going to buy in the next few days? Let's say you are going to maybe buy a uh, camera today. So maybe next few weeks down the line, what are all the various items that might that you might be interested in? So, so that, that's very useful in order to understand the behavior pattern of the user and hence uh, like the, uh, uh, the various organizations can come up with a targeted marketing, like uh, depending upon the, the actual scenario. So sequential analysis is really very useful in order to understand not only the uh, uh, human behavior, it also helps us to understand the flow of various events and uh, it helps us to uh, predict what might happen next and hence to plan um, ahead of time. So moving on to the next one, like uh, what are all the various means to implement the sequential pattern mining? The sequential pattern mining can be implemented using like uh, the two popular methods are a priori and uh, frequent pattern uh, growth. The a priori algorithm is uh, uh, quite memory intensive and then it requires scanning the uh, database multiple times. Whereas in case of a frequential pattern growth, it is just enough for it to scan the database once in the beginning. The a priori based algorithm is breadth first. It helps to identify all the sequential patterns, complete patterns that are present in the data set. Whereas the frequent pattern growth algorithm is depth first. It helps to go into the complete data set and identify like maybe all the patterns. The next one is uh, the frequent pattern in a priori algorithm is identified based on pairing. Like what it means is it means that we first identify the most popular uh, event like uh, element that happens in an uh, sequential data set. So then what happens is we identify for this particular element or for this particular item, what is the next most likely item that can happen after this. So it, it's kind of like uh, we, we draw uh, using the pairing method. We first come up with one item, we identify the next most popular item after this, then we move on to the next one. Like, for, like when we have item A and B, after A and B, what is the most likely item that can happen? So we, draw, we use the pairing method in order to identify the various uh, patterns that are present in the data set. Whereas in case of the frequent pattern growth algorithm, we kind of can use a uh, tree-based model, which can be at times quite complex and uh, maybe difficult to exactly decode what's happening. 
The final one is uh, when the data set is uh, quite large, the frequent pattern growth might not fit in the memory. So that the trees could be like quite complex enough and it might be uh, difficult to compute when we have a limited resource. So that's about the different uh, algorithms that can be used in order to implement the frequential pattern mining. So moving on to the uh, next one, like what are all the various challenges that can happen when we have a frequential pattern mining? One of the uh, most important challenge is uh, there could be a large number of sequential patterns that can be that could be present in the data set. So depending upon what kind of support you use and how large the data set is, that can be a lot of patterns that could be uncovered. When we have exactly a lot of patterns, it means that uh, there are a lot of noise as well. There is a possibility for a lot of patterns to be redundant. Let's say there could be a pattern such as item A, B, C, and D. This is kind of the sequential pattern. What can also happen is there could be a lot of redundant patterns like A, B, C, A to B, and A as in standalone item, or A, C, D. So these are all the various duplicates that happens along with the A, B, C, and D. So it's, uh, it's kind of hard for us to eliminate all these redundant uh, patterns and come up with the true patterns. And, uh, and generally what happens is most of the uh, sequential pattern mining algorithms requires a lot of DB scans, which means that it is time consuming. And when, we, when you have an, uh, exactly a large data set, it, can be, it, can, it could take a lot of time for, in order to uncover all the sequential patterns that are present in the data set. Uh, which means that uh, that could be performance issues as well. And uh, the final one is uh, it might be difficult to extract large sequential patterns. So it, it, it could be quite easy for us to identify like quite popular short sequences. But as we grow, like as we move on to the large sequences, what happens is generally the frequency will be quite low and hence it might not meet the support uh, threshold that we, we usually set. And if there is a large of a large number of uh, like a noise pattern in the data set, it might be a, a bit tricky for us to identify all these useful large sequential patterns that are present in the data set. So that's about the sequential pattern analysis. And if you are interested in knowing more about the sequential pattern analysis, I have uh, provided a few reference links here in this slide which talks and explains about the various sequential pattern analysis, like uh, what it is, what are all the different uh, uh, metrics and measures in it, how to calculate the support, confidence, lift in case of frequential pattern mining, and uh, what are all the different algorithms that are present, what are all the advantages and disadvantages of each of these algorithms. So if you are interested in knowing like quite deep into the sequential pattern analysis, all these reference links can be very useful for you in order to understand uh, about the sequential pattern analysis. So that's it about uh, uh, today. So in the next, next session, what I'm going to do is I'm going to implement the sequential pattern analysis using Python. And I'm going to exactly show you for a small subset, like for a small data set, how would we implement the sequential pattern analysis and how to read the output and uh, how to understand the various patterns that are present in the data set. So see you in the next session and bye until then.